For Kurumu Media's Policy, I'm Sashni Mudli. Joining me today is author Sishle Komaro, here to discuss his book, Milk the Beloved Country. You explain considerable research for this book, which delves into the naming of towns and cities in South Africa. It's an enlightening and sometimes hilarious historical account of the significance of names in our country, especially given the fact that we as a country don't actually have a name. What's the bigger picture that we are missing? From where I'm seated, one thing that we should have focused on as far as name changes are concerned, first and foremost, is the name of the country. Let's think about this rationally. As a country, we actually do not have a name. What we have is a geographic location. We are located on the southern tip of the African continent. And if you look at the history of Namibia as an example, at one stage it was called Southwest Africa because that's exactly where it's located, on the southwestern part of the African continent. Even if you look at um, Zimbabwe and Zambia, at one stage it was Southern and Northern Rhodesia, respectively, but they changed those names, obviously, when they got their independence. So from where I'm seated, I think we are missing a bigger picture when we are focusing on street names and the names of towns and so forth without necessarily focusing first and foremost on the name of the country. You have a strong view that the country, but more especially black people, need to have a conversation about the social value of BE deals. Why? Yes, of course, I, I, feel, I feel strongly about that. If you think about BE as a concept, it makes absolute sense. That's a no-brainer. However, if you look at the way that it was implemented, it leaves a lot to be desired. Um, as an example, you had black politically connected individuals getting the deals by and large, and that left a vast majority of other black people. So that's the first thing. Secondly, and even more importantly, what that did is that it indoctrinated us as black people to play small uh, within the economic space. That explains why even today black people do not dominate in the economic space, purely because of the way it was implemented back then, where as a black person you'll just be okay with getting 2% or 3% or 7.5%. So you had this stampede of black people trying to get that small anyana stake in a white company. And that is why we are where we are now, where still black people are still indoctrinated to play a very small part within the economic arena. Now your book points to history being complicated just as life is, and there is a factoid about Paul Kruger, whose statue was removed during the Rhodes Must Fall movement. What's the connection and subsequent irony involving Kruger and the Mamelodi Township? Oh, well, uh, it was also part of the research as well. There are certain things that I learned when I was doing the research for this book that under normal circumstances I wouldn't have known. As an example, the very issue of Mamelodi, that uh, Paul Kruger was a great whistler, you know, and uh, the name Mamelodi actually is derived from that, that Paul Kruger was a great whistler. You know, he, he would come up with certain melodies, and when you work out with that word, it boils down to Mamelodi. And the very people from Mamelodi will then go now to City Square or CBD and say, Paul Kruger statue must fall. But they are from a township which is named after Paul Kruger. It's just, yeah, it's just the irony of, of the names that we have in this country. An interesting irony you point out is the fact that many Afrikaners still harbor ill feelings towards the English for the concentration camps over 100 years ago. Yet, black people are quickly shut down for showing emotion for apartheid, which ended in the 90s. Yes, indeed. It's uh, also kind of ironic as well, because one of the things that I've done, especially after the publication of my other book, I'll get invitations from, from a number of farmers. They'll read my book and they'll invite me to the farm and we'll sit there and talk about a wide variety of issues. And that issue never fails to come out, the issue of concentration camps. It's always a topical issue amongst the Afrikaners. And I'm sure even the British, the English, they know that the Afrikaners are not over the issue of specifically the concentration camps, what happened to the women, what happened to, to children, how many people died. And, and I find it very strange that the Afrikaners with the concentration camps, that happened a while back. And whereas when a black person talks about the apartheid project, which officially ended in 1994, we are told, no, 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 no. The irony of it, by the way, is the Afrikaners, oh, and amongst other people, it's white people in, as, a, as a collective, and say, no, we must move on. Let us move on. Let's focus on the future, which I agree with. But obviously, we need to reflect on the past because some of the issues that we are dealing with are systemic issues, you know. And I find it very ironic that as a black people, we get told that let us move on very quickly. And yet there are people who are still, you know, harboring ill feelings because of the events that happened more than 100 years ago. Tell us about why the name change of the Second Anglo-Boer War to the South African War is problematic. 
Well, for me, it is it is very problematic. The the what is called now the South African War. Um, I, I I strongly feel no. It was the Anglo Boer War. It must continue being called the Anglo Boer War because yes, the war was between the English, stroke British, and the Afrikaners, stroke Boers. The fact that black people took part on both sides is neither here nor there because if you look at the history again, the war ended up in 1902, and eight years later you had the Union of South Africa. Then what happened to black people who took part in the war? Nobody remembered them. The fact even that we had the Union of South Africa was exactly because of that. It was because now there was peace, there was the union of these two major races, the British, stroke English, African, stroke Boers. And conveniently, black people were nowhere to be found. And yet again, now we are saying, yeah, but black people took part, so it must be the South African War. I'm like, no, that war had absolutely nothing to do with black people, truth be told. After detailing the infamous Bourbon's history and influence, you confess in your book that you don't think black people will ever be ready to govern. Can you just explain why? Yes, yes, that is at the tail end of, of one of the chapters where I deal with Brunda Bond. And uh, I, I get into so much detail and you can see the, the power that the Brunda Bond had. And they were in every facet of the functioning of the society. And I'm saying as black people, look, we had the political power since 1994, but then what? You can almost, looking back, you can almost see that the focus has always been on the political side not on the economic side, not on the social side. That is why we have these issues that we have. Let me give you a practical example. JSE Top 40. There's not even a single company in the JSE Top 40 from a shareholdership perspective which directly reflects the demographics of the country. In other words, there is no company on the JSE Top 40 which is about 90-91% owned by black people. You see, that shows that the focus was strictly on the political side and we never focused on other spheres of life, including the economic sphere. And we've spoken about BEE and how it was implemented uh, and uh, the indoctrination that happened. And that is why I'm saying it's almost as if we were, we were never ready. I, I even use that analogy where a guy follows a girl and proposes love to a girl for a number of years. And then the girl eventually says, OK, I love you too. And then the guy is now stunned all of a sudden because he's got this love on his lap. It's almost like that's what happened to black people. It's like, okay, so now you've got political power and then what? Re really? So for me, that's one of the things looking back that I feel we could have done better. Yes, political side is important, but the economic sphere, it was just like we we're caught unaware. We we're not sure exactly what to do now. Now, okay, now we voted on the 27th of April, 1994. And then what? And, and, and then what? So it, 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 it irks me, it comes out strongly in the book that the, the strategy should have been much more all-encompassing, multifaceted. I go into history of the, of the Africaners with regards to how they ended up with this power that they had. They had uh, the political platform in terms of the Nationalist Party, they had a mouthpiece instead of with regards to what in English you would call the National Press or National Press, Nas Press. Um, they had an, an intellectual center called the University of Stellenbosch and they had an economic power, both Santam and Sanlam. Those were organizations that were started strictly to empower the Afrikaners uh, economically. All that happened between 1914 and 1918, right? So when you're looking at the power that the Afrikaners had, the foundation was laid within those four years, multifaceted strategy. Now, if I were to ask you, show me such a strategy for black people, what will you show me? You know, so that is why we are where we are, because I strongly feel the focus was almost exclusively on the political arena and uh, not on the other facets of life, including, including by the way, the intellectual aspirations. I mean, look, look at the role that was played by, as I said, Stellenbosch University yeah. with regards to, you know, the intellectual center of, of the Afrikaners. Mm -hmm. Show me the intellectual center of black people post-1994, just like something that they developed where you would know that in all probability future leaders will come from this center. It comes as no surprise, by the way, that a number of prime ministers for South Africa came from Stellenbosch because that was the intention originally, that uh, we, this is where we will mold and train future leaders who might not necessarily play only in the political arena but in other spheres of the society as well. And as black people, as far as I'm aware, we've never come up with something like that, an intellectual center. People that will not only come with the philosophy on how black people will be uplifted, 
but also people who will intellectually challenge things and defend whatever philosophy that you are implementing as government of the day. Now you believe that the Commission's Act of 1947 should be repealed. Can you tell us why and also why you question whether the judiciary can be trusted? Yeah, no, sure. So let's start with the Commission's Act. You know, the Commission's Act, by the way, if you look at it and you read it, someone who is in contravention of the Act, if you are found guilty, you can get away with a fine of 50, 50 pounds. The reason why they are talking about pounds is because, as you just rightfully said, it was promulgated way back in the 1940s, before we even started using the rand. And we're still using a piece of legislation that refers to if you are found to be guilty that you can be fined in pounds. So that's the first thing. So effectively, it means the very piece of legislation that is used in order to have a commission of inquiry is so outdated that you cannot go and attend the commission and when you are charged you'll be charged in contravention of this particular act but then you can get away with a fine totaling 50 pounds which you know is, is not a big thing in the big scheme of things so i'm saying but come on someone has been sleeping at the wheel why do we have a commission's act of 1947 still talking about pounds when we've been using the rent since the 1960s it just does not make sense and we all know that in future there's going to be a commission on one way or the other and this will be the foundation of setting up a commission the commission's act because that is its duty but then you are talking about an old piece of legislation that thing should have been ripped apart that all over have almost a new commission's act so that's the first part and uh, regarding the judiciary i'm just saying in a in a democratic dispensation like ours it is very important that we engage with decisions that are taken not only by the executive but also decisions that are taken by legislature and also equally important we must engage with decisions taken by the judiciary it does not sit well with me and this is something that i dwell with in, in one of the chapters as an example that uh, there was a man from alexandra who was killed and when his family directly approached the constitutional court and uh, they were saying come on here is our brother he had been killed and uh, the commission what did the constitutional court say they did not grant them direct access and i'm saying so it effectively means if again we're to have another level five as an example and your loved one is killed you will be faced with the same challenges that that family was faced with where when you approach especially the highest court in the land it says it does not see the interests of justice with regards to an individual that was allegedly assaulted by soldiers and they did not have any legal makeups where they could challenge the soldiers because we do not deal with soldiers all the time in this country. That's one thing that really I felt the Constitutional Court, at least from where I'm seated, could have or should have uh, granted direct access. More importantly, because one of the things that the family was looking for was a tribunal which was going to deal with any other complaints we as a society were going to have regarding the soldiers which had been let loose on us. And yet the Constitutional Court said, no, we are not granting you direct access. And, uh, and the family went on to fire saying, well, we would like to have a tribunal which will be chaired by a retired judge so that all of us as the people of the land would have been able to, whenever we feel that there is misconduct, will have gone to this tribunal knowing full well that there will be proper investigation without any fear and without any favor. But the Constitutional Court, you know, in its wisdom, decided not to grant uh, di direct access. That just did not sit well with me, more especially because, you know, this thing could happen again, that soldiers are let loose on us. Effectively, they can almost, like, kill your loved one, and then what happens then? So that's the first thing that I deal with. And another, obviously, is this issue where one of the political parties, the Democratic Alliance, also applied for direct access, questioning the validity or constitutionality of uh, the Disaster Management Act. And again, the Constitutional Court did not grant direct access. So you've got a man allegedly assaulted, but definitely killed. That's a fact of life. The man is dead. The family says, this man was assaulted by soldiers. Here we are. Constitutional Court grant us direct access so that other families will not have to go through the same thing. There should be a tribunal which is set up to investigate this issue of alleged misconduct by soldiers. The Constitutional Court says, no, we are not granting you direct access. There is this piece of legislation, Disaster Management Act, 
which is very dangerous because once the president has declared a disaster, what that does is that it neutralizes one arm of government legislature. So in other words, the executive, the ministers can almost do as they please because now there's no oversight. And that is one of the key issues that I have with this piece of legislation. But then in its wisdom, again, the constitutional court said, no, we are not granting direct access. And then, this is the final incident that I talk about, a man walks out of uh, a commission without the permission of the chairperson. And when the commission applies for direct access, the constitutional court in its wisdom decides to grant direct access. And I'm just saying, well, as a South African who never studied law for a single day, this does not sit well with me. they just declaring inconsistency. Someone is killed, allegedly by soldiers, and you say, as a court, you do not see the interests of justice in that, in granting direct access. That's the first thing. Secondly, there is a piece of legislation which potentially is unconstitutional, and uh, Somebody approaches you and says, yeah, well, this piece of legislation, there are certain things which are unconstitutional here because what it does is that it neutralizes one arm of government. And as a result, you've got the executive doing whatever that they want to do, as we saw. And the constitutional court again says, no, yeah, well, we are not granting direct access here. And then a man walks out of a room without a permission of the chairperson. And when the commission applies for direct access, then it is granted. Well, I just sit there, I'm like, oh, well, I never studied law, but to me, this, this is clearing inconsistency. There's an incident that occurred during the July 2021 unrest involving stolen ammunition, and you believe South Africans should be more outraged about this? Yeah, well, well, that I deal with in, in one of the chapters where I ask, is South Africa already a failed state? You see, it is one thing, as an example, it is one thing when people break into your apartment or into your house and they steal stuff. All right. You must also still hope that the thugs and the criminals will be caught and they will face the full might of the law. But it is something totally different when criminals or thugs go to the police station and still fire arms and ammunition. So that's the first part. It's, you know, things like that should happen in banana republics or failed states. But there's been a couple of those incidents in South Africa, and I quote that. All right, but then during the insurrection or failed insurrection in July 2021, there were cases where, specifically one case where there was a container which was illegally moved from the port of Devon to this uh, warehouse in, in, in somewhere outside Devon, and then it was broken into. And we are told that uh, there was ammunition, one million bullets, thereabouts, other people or other reports go as far as 1.5 million bullets. And I'm just saying, no. This leaves me very, very uncomfortable when there are people who've been stealing firearms at different police stations over a period of time. Now they've got 1 million, 1.5 million bullets, which are unaccounted for, still are stolen from a container. That does not sit well with me as a South African. And maybe this could explain this assassination crime that we have, people getting shot. I mean, I was, I was taken aback when the reports came through that uh, on average in this country, about 80 people get shot, get killed. 80. It's just like, it's for a country that is not at war to have on average 80 people murdered. It's, it's appalling. But that is the state of the country that we're in. And I'm saying we need to have a, a very open, frank conversation. Are we already a failed state? And as I say in the book, maybe the fact that I'm even asking that is maybe because I am biased. I do not want this country to fail. Maybe it's not even worth asking the question anymore. Maybe we already are a failed state. Then obviously, what is it that needs to be done? If we are not a failed state, because I still think there's still a window of opportunity. There are signs and symptoms that we could be a failed state, but there's still a window of opportunity that things could change. Because trust me, in my travels, I've been through failed states have been through banana republics you do not want your country to be a failed state because it takes generations to get it out it's not one of those things where you're a failed state today and then next week you get your your things right again no it takes generations for you to come out but also the vice versa is also correct you do not go to bed today and things are relatively okay and you wake up in a failed state no it takes time it's just these things that happen and you're thinking, oh yeah, things will be better, things will be better. But it's just a, a gradual decline over time. And once you 
get to that tipping point where you are, boom, a failed state, well, then it's over. Then it's definitely over. It will be over for our generation. It will probably be over for our kids and our grandchildren. Because as I said, it just takes time for a failed state to come up. Why do you believe that South Africans lose endless opportunities for genuine national conversations because of our obsession with the Roma nation? Yes, I genuinely feel that we lost an opportunity, specifically in the mid-1990s. You know, after voting, great. That's a political issue, settled. But there are structural issues that should have been dealt with just post-April 1994. There are certain conversations that we should have had. But instead of having open, frank conversations, especially with regards to systemic, structural issues, because it's all good and well. We all know, well, I voted in 1994. That says a lot about my age. I voted in 1994. But then there are structural issues that were never dealt with. Purely because you voted, okay, now you're equal. You stood on that long queue. And then what? You go back to your shack. Uh, you go back to the township go back to rural areas, there are structural issues that, if you ask me, were never dealt with uh, because we were just given this, okay, now we are equals, which was never true. Never, never. The fact that we voted, that did not necessarily mean that all of a sudden, just like that, we were equals. We were never equals. And I feel by us as a people being given this rainbow nation, let's all just rally around this thing. It's good. It's great. It gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling. It does. It gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling. You go to bed feeling, oh, wow, we are a united nation. But then again, you are poor, you are black, you're living in an informal settlement, you're living in a shack. That's not going to change. The fact that we are now Rainbow Nation, uh, Springboks won the Rugby World Cup in 95. Oh, great. All singing the street social laws of the following year, 1996. Bafana Bafana won the African Cup of Nations. Exciting. Great. But the structural issues remain. One of the reports that I talk about, and I think it's the most comprehensive poverty-related report, it was done over a 20-year period looking at poverty trends done by States SA. One of the things that they found out as part of the report was that an average white family spends five times more than an average black family. So if they are going to spend white family, it's going to spend five times more than an average black family. That also talks in terms of income inequality. So those are the type of conversations that we should have had post-1994. But then because of this rainbow nation, now we equals, we never got to have that conversation. And one final thing, by the way, that I need to mention there, it's uh, we have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and one of the things that they recommended was that listed companies should uh, donate at least 1% of their market capitalization. In other words, then to donate 1% of their size. But that recommendation was totally ignored. Totally, totally ignored. Listed companies never donated 1% of their market capitalization, which was one of the recommendations by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. You ask yourself why. Why wasn't that never followed through? There's just no doubt, and I speak about it as well, there's just no doubt that corporate South Africa, business South Africa, benefited from the apartheid project in, amongst other things, cheap black labor. So that is the context amongst other things that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission said, look, 1% of your market cap as a once-off, not an, as an annual event, as a once-off. Even that was never followed through. But then again, who, who, who must take responsibility for that? Because there was a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, there were recommendations, and somebody should have followed that through. So it's all good and well now to talk about the State Capture Commission and the recommendations thereof. I agree, we need to implement those and follow through on those recommendations. But we must not lose sight of the fact that we've had another very serious commission in this country. And there, the recommendation, this very key one, was never implemented. And you hardly ever hear South Africans talking about that, that, hey, by the way, 1% of market cap for at least the listed entities never went onto this fund, which, by the way, could have then been called a Rainbow Nation Fund. You see, then, then, then there's something substantive instead of just a term yeah. and that you rally people around. At least now you're saying there is a fund with so many billions. What do we do with these billions? Exactly. But that never happened. And lastly, are you hopeful about South Africa's future? We can never lose hope. 
we, we, we must never lose hope. But it all depends on what we do as South Africans, both collectively and individually. This is the last opportunity really for us as South Africans to take this thing seriously, to have open, frank conversations about the state of the nation and what needs to be done collectively. It is about time that we hold our leaders responsible. This issue that we will just be excited that a leader is coming through and they throw t-shirts on, on, on us, that's fine. You can take the t-shirt, it's fine. But we still need to have proper and very frank conversations with our leader. Hold them accountable. Ensure that if there is wrongdoing that has happened, that the people are held, are held uh, responsible, including political leaders, including uh, fraud, corruption, money laundering, racketeering, that happens within the political sphere. The judicial system in this regard, let us be frank, has let us down. There are so many people who are known. The media, the investigative journalists, they report these things almost on a weekly basis. And then what happens? The police, why don't they, why don't they arrest the perpetrators or the alleged perpetrators for, for that? Why don't we have the big fish appearing in a court of law in this country? So that is part of the very frank conversations that we need to have in this country that until we see justice being done, especially when it comes to the big fish, nothing else will change. There will still be fraud, there will still be corruption, and this country before you know it will be a failed state. And that is one of the things that made me to write this book, just to say, come on South Africans, we can do better, both collectively and individually. That was author Sishle Kamalo discussing his latest book, Mok the Beloved Country.